Welcome, Welcome ladies, ladies and, and gentlemen, gentlemen to the Vinnie Eastwood, Vinny Eastwood show with the echo, the echo that doesn't go away until now. My very special guest is the wonderful Gaelic philosopher, none other, none other than Thomas Sheridan. Welcome to the program, bro. Hey, Vinny. <laughs> do you want to see a Charlie Sheen? Do you want to see a Charlie Sheen chemtrail, do you? Yeah. Do you want to see a Charlie? Watch, look. <sighs> <laughs> Listen, hey there, it's the line on the on the on the mirror instead of the line in the sky. I love it. <laughs> I did I, I did that one. I did that one at a talk in England a few years ago, and people were like laughing for like twenty minutes straight. Uh, oh, they would do. They would do. I mean, cause, yeah. hey, what's not funny about Charlie Sheen's drug habits? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, in fact, did you ever see the uh, the Charlie Sheen roast on uh, on Comedy Central? I, I watched that, and um, it's just whole bunches of people, you know, all these celebrities and everything like that, just just for basically a straight hour giving him abuse about hookers and blow. It was classic. Now, even when you said when you said Charlie Sheen roast, I'm thinking like uh, he's how. Ho- Boring the rocks under his crack pipe or something. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Charlie. Sorry. Yeah, we we mean no offense. Just as long no as you offense, share some no of offense, it. No offense, man. Just I'm, sure, I'm sure you're a nice fella. I'm sure you're a nice fella. Yeah, I mean, well, he probably shares a lot of it. You know, that's that. That's all that's really counted. You know, you can do as much drugs as you want, just as long as you give me some. Now, anyway. Um, the oh, reason I've got you on here, bro, is because you, 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 we recently went to, through a number of turmoils with your health kind of thing, but you went to a doctor and it found out that there was nothing wrong, which would lead us to believe that there's some kind of um, uh, psychological or, or stress-type situation involved here. Could you kind of explain uh, uh, the whole process that you've been going through just recently? I th- understand things have been quite tough for you. Well, I didn't know my, this was going to be the subject tonight. It's a good thing I didn't have gonorrhea or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> no, Go, well, gonorrhea is that a ven, is that a venereal disease that means that you're a goner? <laughs> oh God, uh, I don't know. I mean, I just got these like really weird pains for the last few months, right? And it's like I feel fine other way. In every other way, I feel great. These really weird hip pains. And I'm thinking, well, what's wrong with me? And I go to get all these tests and all these, you know, it doesn't cost me anything, but all these expensive tests they've done. And they found, they're telling me I'm perfectly healthy. I'm perfectly healthy. And I'm telling them, well, why do I have these pains in my side? And they says, there's no blood, there's no cancer, there's no diseases, there's no nothing. And it's like, uh, and then she says, well, are you stressed out? And I says, well, I'm kind of very busy. But I'm not like stressed out like when I used to work in like the corporate world or even when I worked in a factory. That was much more stressing. Mm. And so uh, there's all kinds of theories I'm being attacked uh, and this kind of thing, which I don't feel it really. But uh, I don't know. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird when you when, when you, you have this thing and, and people say to you and the doctor says to you, they have all these machines, you know, they have all these computers and everything. And they, you see, they take they take like so much blood from you and so much all kinds of other body fluids. Right. And then they say, oh, you're in perfect health. And yet you're in pain. I mean, what, what is their purpose? Obviously, you can't be in perfect health. You know, It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those people who are perfectly healthy, everybody who's healthy walks around in constant pain and agony, don't they? You know, that seems perfectly reasonable yeah. to me. I'm wondering now, like, in our, are you fluoridated down there? You are, aren't yeah, you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now I'm starting to wonder it's something like that, you know, like years and years of fluoride. Even though I've been taking out the fluoride for a while now, that accumulation is in there from even washing it gets in your, through your skin and everything. Yeah, you can't so, get rid of uh, it. It gets into your bones. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. Well, you can kind of you can get rid of it the same way you get rid of heavy metals, but it still takes years and years. Yeah, I know. But uh, yeah, I'm, it's probably some shit like that, or maybe maybe it is a, uh, you know, maybe it's psychosomatic or something like that. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. But it's like it's I've, it's not my, nothing like this ever happened in my life. Yeah, you know, it's never happened. So it's a bit weird. But there you go. What can you do? Oh well, I think it. Happens I'm still here. The they haven't they haven't killed yet. Yeah. Well, let's hope not. And. Uh, 
it happens all the time i found like people have these really phantom sort of uh, illnesses and, and the medical system just has no idea and then half the time they'll go to some sort of uh, naturopath or alternative doctor and they'll go oh you're magnesium deficient just give you a supplement and you and you and you and you're right as rain in, in like 24 hours or something like that i see that kind of stuff happen all the time but I'm not sure if that that'd be what's happening here but you know purpose of having you on here was not only to discuss all this all this kind of stuff and the, and the things that you're going through but also just to you know have a few laughs have a good time and uh and uh, help cheer you up at least oh well thanks i very much i appreciate that I, i'm i'm always good for a laugh yeah 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 you know my my my, my motto is feck him if they can't take a joke yeah <laughs> <laughs> Now, speaking of which, oh, there was this really interesting element that um, uh, we discussed during the uh, the psychopath roundtable, is that psychopaths are infectious. And I was kind of thinking to myself, like, uh, I'm kind of engaged in a little in a little kind of private war with a, with a psychopath on my own ground uh, at the moment. And uh, I was just wondering, how long do you go up against them before they start to infect you with this scumbaggery? You mean like when you kind of sink down to their level? Is that yeah, way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you'd never sink down. To, if it's a real psychopath, you'd never sink down to their level. You just wouldn't. Mm. But yeah, they, that's the whole point. They're trying. They, they try to push your buttons. You know, it's why big nations, big bully nations, pick on small nations. Why? Because they know they can beat them in a war. So they they agitate them constantly. You know, like. The big name, and it's the same thing with the bu- the big the bully psychopath. They constantly agitate and agitate because they know they can take you down, because they will go to the depths that you a, a normal person with normal decency would never sink to. Mm. I mean, you would never you would have this morality, compassion. You would say to yourself, well, if sh- he or she is a piece is a piece of dirt, right? And uh, they've sunk so low. I'm not going to go that low because he has a wife or kid. And that I wouldn't want them involved in it. You know, that kind of a thing where a psychopath would think nothing of bringing wives and kids and family members in and as part of the attack upon you. Mm. So you would, you'd have to be really pretty debased to get to their level. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's... But it does affect you. It does affect you because it affects your relationship with other people too because you suddenly see the world as a darker place because of this exposure to this individual. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I made a little meditation track that allows me to kind of uh, 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 release the tension of the psychopath that I'm up against. And uh, every time I play it uh, for like 18 seconds or so, suddenly all that really anger, that rage, that that need to expose that scumbaggery of this particular scumbag uh, just kind of like melts away. And it's like, ah, nice, peaceful, serene. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think that a lot of people who are going up against psychopaths have that kind of benefit of being able to just suddenly shirk off that negativity. It's it's almost like some kind of a um like 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 a leeching parasite has attached itself to your brain stem and is just sucking the happiness out of your life. Oh, it's true because that's really what it's about energy. But at the same time, too, don't be hung up on this hippie bullshit of I'm sorry, this hippie stuff of uh. Not, not, you're not on your show now, Thomas. You know, this hippie stuff of uh, of uh, love and, and sign of peace. Because, you know, ra- rage and anger, like Johnny Rotten has said, is an energy. And I've, you know, that, that stuff exists for a reason because you're supposed to get it out. Because if you don't get it out, you can get cancer. and Or you can just, you know, become an alcoholic or a drug addict or something like that. Or just your whole relationship with the rest of the human race goes wrong. So it's, you know... I mean, I have, you know, I don't know if you if you're into martial arts or boxing, but it's just a good, as much a good idea, to 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 hit a punch bag for a few hours or that kind of chop a tree down or well, you know, chop some wood and that kind of thing. Uh, that's that's nothing wrong with that because you got to get that energy out mm. because if you don't, it'll just it becomes like this sort of repetitive feedback loop and it only goes one place and that's to damage you. Yeah, a lot of the time I just I'll just sing angry music. That helps. Yeah, that's a good one. That's what I do as well. Uh, you know, like I play guitar and I have like, you know, and I play, I just go mad, you know, like, and that gets it out of me. And that works for me. I believe like that uh, loud music today, like metal, punk, the old the old style hip hop and industrial, they're like the modern shamanic traditions in many ways when you think about it, because they allow people to purge the negativity of an experience out of them in the same way tribal dancing and screaming and shouting and walking on colds would. That's what we do today. And that's why when you go to like these like, you know, hardcore metal festivals and stuff, you meet the nicest kids. 
because they've channeled it all out in the mosh pit. Yeah, yeah, it's ironic that, isn't it? Yeah, because they've got it all out of the system. Mm, mm, mm. Well, you know, if I could be so bold as to say, I think this is the reason why psychopaths wound up in control of the music industry. Because <laughs> it's kind of like um, the vaccine industry. You know, they want to publish, the, they want to uh, uh, produce the poison as well as the cure, so that they get to reap all the benefits. Exactly, it's just the same thing. And they're all, you know, if you look at all the big, the big music companies, you know, the really big ones like Sony, they're tied up in all kinds of transhumanist technology and they've got ownership of pharmaceutical companies and all the board of directors all moved between entertainment, industrial complex, entertainment, military complex, entertainment, this, that and the other. So they're, they're, it's all tied in. They're all like, you know, I'm all right, Jack. I'll grease your palm if you grease mine. Mm, mm. and they know they know the music that messes us up and the music that messes you up you know what the music that really started messing people up was in the late 60s you know like that 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 infamous coke ad i'd like to teach the world to see all a hippie kind of they knew that that music was actually causing problems in people because it, like when they saw the first rock and roll the rock and roll say jerry lee lewis elvis little richard they noticed a change in american society at the time because they saw like that white folks white white poor people were a lot more relaxed and making friends and hanging out with black african-american people and that's why they took elvis put him in the army and he went from being like it's those four that forced that elvis album it's quite hardcore when you listen to it day you can't believe it's like 1956 or something and then when he comes out of the army it's like blue hawaii and all this like lame old hollywood music and they knew that they they, they put you on this kind of musical prozac like that movie one one flew over the cuckoo's nest that awful music that plays in the mental hospital all the time they, that they know exactly what to do with us and they, 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 they make our brains fluff so we don't have any kind of purging of the toxins so that we, they'll have to, we'll have to go for medication to get that or anything you know tv you know, or violent video games all that stuff well you just need to distract yourself from the reality that life sucks for in as in as many ways as possible i guess is the objective Absolutely, and it does. You know, I mean, I mean, life is is pretty rubbish for you know when you think about it. It, it, it. Before you kind of wake up, that's the, that's when I always say to people, like, they, they wake up and they say, "I'm depressed about it. I wish I never woke up." And he says, "You actually going to tell me you were happier when you were walking around the shopping mall, when you were happier putting your faith in a in a football team or a rugby team that didn't win, and you were depressed about it, and you got drunk. You would think that was better." And the, the reality is, waking up frees you of so much of that, even though it puts another kind of element of you see how these psychopaths run the world but at the, another level it does liberate you in so many ways and they that's why they don't want people waking up and that's why they give them celebrities to sort of wake up for them you understand that's a new thing now they're now giving you wake up celebrities i don't have to wake up this famous person will do it for me Sounds like exactly the same kind of abdication of responsibility that's been advocated the entire time, doesn't it? Just like religion. I don't have to be spiritual, I'll just have the bishop and the whatever do it for me. Yeah, doesn't work very well if you're a uh, prepubescent choir boy. Now, the other element here, uh, which I find uh, particularly fabulous, is the fact that despite waking up despite realizing that the world's run by corrupt criminal scum you kind of have to learn how to enjoy your life all over again and the best part about it is you're free from a lot of distractions because you've now identified that they are in fact distractions now your life mm. can actually begin and and one of these um uh, one of my listeners yesterday and i and i said something real nasty to him i don't I actually kind of regret saying it now. He was saying, oh, it all sucks. It's all, it's all hopeless. And I go, well, then why don't you kill yourself? All right. If, if you think everything's so hopeless and you're trying to convince everybody to stop fighting against the new world order, against the scumbaggery, why don't you just put yourself out of your misery and stop disadvantaging everybody else who does actually want to fight and kill yourself? Now, that may have been really harsh, but... My point was, and I don't think I iterated this properly, is that you're still alive. While you're still alive, there is still hope. While there is breath in your body, blood in your veins, you are not yet defeated. The only thing that can defeat you while you're still alive is yourself. So if you don't like yourself, if you don't want to win, 
what is the point in being alive? You're wasting this precious gift. Yeah, and if you're going to die, you know, die with honor, you know, jump into a jump off a building holding on to Rus Justin Bieber or something like that. Die honorably. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine we had a light like, terminal philosophy. Oh, baby! But well, you see, but that's another important part of it as well. Although it it, it is it is a, a rat hole and it is it is nasty. Never ever ever lose your sense of humor because that this, this we need gallows humor now more than ever. Yeah, more than ever. Yeah. Well, part of the gallows is lows. And boy, are we going through some lows right now. And um, I do think that it is the survival mechanism that we need. Okay? You know, like if you go to if you go to triage or something like that and you've got a, uh, I don't know, you, you, you've got a, a an arm off or something like that. And they, they, they uh, I don't know, they heat up a shovel on a Bunsen burner or something and cauterize the wound with it. Whatever. Whatever it takes. Just as long as you stop bleeding and bleating and start getting active, right? Because I, I found that's another thing that that really messes people up. Don't you don't, don't you notice, Sh 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 Thomas? Is that the people who are doing nothing are often the ones who are the most depressed about the things that are happening. The people who are doing heaps, on the other hand, it's it comes and goes because they get to chase yeah, it away. Yeah, they have. Energy. They're burning the energy out again. Where the ones I find the ones who are the most depressed are the ones who are spending all day skinning up and watching the most negative videos on the internet, and they're not actually doing anything. And it's like you gotta you gotta put intention into action. And when you do that, your brain feels better. You're flooding that dopamine and adrenaline into your brain, and one little victory a week can make all the difference. Yes, it can. We'll be right back, folks. No matter where you live. Globalism affects you. Did you know that the Vinnie Eastwood Show has more subscribers than New Zealand Herald TV and is New Zealand's most popular YouTube news channel where warm-hearted humour and a list of awesome guests talk about crucial issues which the mainstream media ignore. A show where you, the listener, can phone up with questions, comments and suggestions of guests. Vinnie is building a hub to connect truthers with raw information they need to become active. He can help you gain further skills such as website building, producing audio and video, and creating revenue streams in your own multimedia environment. Because Vinny supports such a wide range of people in the truth movement, he is not government or corporate backed and relies entirely on your donations. Give now, give generously, or subscribe for $10 a month for access to ad-free video archives. Just visit the VinnieEastwoodShow.com and click donate. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. The sun is shining somewhere on Earth, certainly isn't the Northern Hemisphere. My very special guest is Thomas Sheridan coming at us live. And uh, um, what I'd like to understand a little bit about you, Thomas, is you've, you've kind of devoted this career to exposing scumbaggery and talking about a whole bunch of other things, not just about psychopaths even though that's kind of what you're most noted for i wondered if you'd uh, share with the listeners some of your uh, your other interests that have been tick that have been tickling you recently the legal ones well uh the psychopath thing was the psychopath thing was a uh, an accident that really happened it wasn't something i planned it happened quite by accident it was just sort of a i like Art and writing and music was and, and graphic design was what I was doing. And I just said, oh, I'd be kind of neat to write a book on psychopaths. If no one read it, it wouldn't matter really. It'd be kind of interesting to do this anyway, because it was kind of like the stuff that I've been studying for years. It might be interesting to somebody. And I was amazed that it actually gave me another job. You know, it was like a part -time, another part-time job came for me. So that was a complete surprise for me. I never, ever was interested that no sorry not interested but ever never really thought that it would ever happen now what was interesting was that at the time i was doing it i was far more interested in social engineering control of perceptions marketing and how the human consciousness is attacked by media and and that kind of thing and and all these kinds of uh, these perceptive 
impacts on our on our consciousness and psyche. And the psych the psychopathic thing was an aspect of that because ultimately because the system is psychopathic, I'd found uh, what you call it uh, correlations between the two. And so the psychopath thing was writ that book was written out there, but I was always interested in the other stuff more and always in the background because they are they they are connected big time. Because our perceptions are everything in terms of how we see ourselves, you know, how we view the world, how we even how reality appears to us even. And so that was always my main interest. I was always very, very interested in art, always very interested in, in human consciousness, how it's perception, very interested in literature, big time, not to be a stereotype, but I am. And I was interested in psychology. So it was a good sort of addendum to all that stuff. It was an appendix, really, in a way. But it was surprise, very surprising to me that that all took off. And I'm glad it did because people tell me all over the world it's helped them in their own lives to deal with their, but it, you know, these creeps at work or with bad, you know, toxic and dangerous relationships. And that has been very fulfilling for me. I was very happy that that happened. But my main interest has always been what it means to be a human being in this world in terms of how we perceive our self-identity according to the external stimuli imposed upon us by mass media, education, religion, and law. Could you give an example? An example for, it, well, everything really. Let's give, I'll give, here, there's one example would be, we talked about music earlier on, okay? You can see how, if you go through the history of the world, you can see how fashion and music were one time not connected. Fashion and acting and theatre were not one connected, okay? So fashion was developed. If you look at the fashions of the Victorian times, it didn't, you know, the men didn't wear clothes because Oscar Wilde dressed that way or Henry Irving, the actor, dressed that way. It was, that was the fashion of the time based on how tailors would cut and design cloth. The same for women. The fashions moved in a very kind of a, an independent way. With the arrival of cinema, and in particular the growth of stars such as Rudolph Valentino, you would have you would have changes in how men and women would dress, wear makeup, and you had then the flapper movement. The flapper movement directly came out of how women were portrayed in early Hollywood films, and that went on. That changed, and then it happened with music later. You had the Bobby Soxer movement, which were young women who wore a specific fashion based on, I believe, what. In jokingly, Frank Sinatra said was his favorite style in a woman's clothing in an early advert. So they all became coupled. So therefore, human self-identity was directly related according to realities that are imposed upon them were not necessarily in any way natural. They were not a product of anything that developed in a, so a socio-cultural sense that had come from the bottom. They were purely imposed upon above. And what made that what made that happen were three things. The cinema, publishing, and the transmission of sound, either wireless radio or music. And that's what changes as a species in the last hundred years. Well, in such a way, the saturation of these different forms of uh, media that you're living your life in, you're basically bathing in it, it means that that media determines what your desires become rather than your desire, desires determining what the media will become. Yeah, exactly. You, we, that's why I say the most important thing we have to do is to actually make our own media to subvert the mainstream media. Because the mainstream media, because of you know a psychotic, psychopathic, vicious, evil pedophile such as Jimmy Savile at the BBC, and how he was protected by the, not only the, the, the upper echelon by the BBC, but nearly all the stars in there that worked with him, as well as the British establishment, shows how dangerous it is that that guy, this monster, this, this psychotic, vicious paedophile, who is like, you know, even people that knew him said he wasn't human, and I don't even believe he was human, consider like the, how industrial is, 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 is the scale of his depravity was, this individual was a prime example of why the mainstream media cannot be trusted anymore and certainly no, why nobody ever again in the UK should ever buy a, buy a TV license or 
purchase or support the BBC because what that was was a de declaration of war by mass media on the most innocent and vulnerable people of British society. And they hid it, protected it, and kept it going. And what they did is as bad as any, any war crime, any violation of human rights, and it's absolute disgrace. And taxpayers in Britain have to pay for that. Mm. Now, just recently, uh, Transparency International released its Corruption Perception Index. I like it how they call it a Corruption Perception Index as opposed to a Corruption Reality Index, all right? Because New Zealand and Denmark are first equal as the least corrupt country in the world. I live in this country. I speak to the activists in this country. There is no fracking way that this country is the least corrupt country in the world. I mean, it's it's more corrupt than the Robert Mugabe regime, for frack's sake. So, here's the thing. It's not that New Zealand's not corrupt at all. It's that it's so corrupt that any of the people who would do any of the investigation of corruption are also corrupt. That's how corrupt it is. And... In so doing, the society, and, and that includes the media, doesn't it? Because the media is supposed to investigate corruption, the media is supposed to expose it, but they're not. Why? Because they are corrupt too. Precisely, yeah. They're probably the most corrupt of all, because they are charged with a mandate to actually report on these things. This is, especially if you have, I don't, do you have a national TV network in, in, in New Zealand? Oh, by the government. Yeah, you have your own kind of, you have your own BB. Well, TV in countries like yours, and, yeah, in Ireland it's RTE, but they're all like national broadcasters. They're specifically chartered, in theory, to serve the interests of the citizenry, and above anything else, above the government, above anything. And the app, the opposite is true. Every country that has a national broadcaster, the national broadcaster is a propagandist for the plutocracy that runs each and every country they're in. Yeah. Uh, they do the direct opposite of everything that they say they're going to do. That's why they keep away. That's why they keep getting away with these scams for so long. Okay, and pe people say, "Oh, oh, buddy, but they they can't be true. It just can't be true." Whoa, 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 hold on a second. Are you telling me that if a scam artist came up to you with the intention of scamming you, that they would tell you that they're scamming you before they did so? Is that what you're telling me? Of course they wouldn't. They, they they've got it stitched up, mate. Okay. The government's corrupt, the police are corrupt, the judiciary is corrupt, the, the, uh, the reporting's corrupt, and the business is corrupt. And they all work in concert. It's just that simple. Yep. No wonder they don't get exposed. I was, uh, I'm, I was, you know, I was just talking about, like, joking at the beginning when I said the, le the illegal ones. And why I said my illegal interests. And what made me say that was, and it directly relates to what you said. Last week, I was walking through the fields where, near where I live, and I saw a magic mushroom. Right, one late in the year, a psilocybin mushroom, right? And I was looking at it, and I was just thinking to myself, if I was to pick that up right now and a cop was nearby, I could risk up to eight years in prison. Yet, the bankers in this country, right, that's a plant, a fungus out of the ground, the bankers in this country were caught on tapes, Anglo-Irish Bank, swindling and hiding their debts in order to get a bailout from the IMF and laughing about it. And the government is deliberately protecting them and delaying the tribunal so the statutes of limitation will be up before they have to go to prosecution. Yeah, I was looking at the ground and I was saying, if I pick up that one illegal fungus that's growing there, just to even touch it, to pluck it, you don't have to, I don't have to even consume it, just to pluck it, I'm looking at eight years in prison. You tell me that that's how the that 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 is a, that is that is we are, that is like a sane world. It's not, and that's how corrupt we are. That's how far down the toilet hole we've gone. Yeah, I've been telling people for a long time. You know, when they they tell me, oh, I just don't understand that. You know, why would the mushrooms be illegal and and, and ripping off people being the banker is being legal? Oh, I don't get it. I don't get it. Well, it's because you're not a psycho. Okay. Yeah. If you're a complete psycho, suddenly the world would make a hell of a lot of sense to you. The reason why that is is because it's run and set up by psychos. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, true. it's, it's like um, God made us in His image, and the psychos made the world in theirs. Yeah, and you know they have a hatred of nature. I find that interesting as well. They hate anything natural. They hate anything that nature makes. 
the earth and they and even though they talk about their environmentalism their ecology and they have all their tv programs and all the little mandates and all the little climate change sub summits you will see that they're so divorced from the natural world they're not even literally residents of this planet there has been that uh, that talk by David Icke saying that there is this uh, this uh, reptilian kind of um, uh, conspiracy going on, and he says that it's something along the lines of it's a frequency thing. So if you're capable of shifting your frequency or your code or something of that nature, you can shape shift, you can change forms and and, and what have you. Now, if you take that literally. It sounds a little bit far out there, but if you take it as an analogy, shape shifting by changing by changing your frequency. What's frequency? Well, if you have a look at uh, uh, your heart and your emotions and what have you, your body actually gives off particular frequencies when you're feeling certain things. So if they're able to change their frequency per se, they can devoid themselves of, of having any actual emotions that they don't want. Not only that, but they can mirror your emotions so that they can sucker you in and manipulate you and take you over and mind control you. And if you, okay, I don't know if there's reptilians or not. I don't, well, other than the lizards that live in the, the ground that are in, you know. But I, I don't know if there's reptilian being shifting humans. Uh, I haven't seen any proof of it. I could, it could be true. I don't know. I don't. It's not. But I do get the idea of the reptilian brain and all that stuff. I know that stuff is for real, and that does plays a huge part in psychopaths. However, as we're talking about this energetic stuff, what I will say is, many people, in fact, most normal people, when they first encounter a psychopath, right, they have a sense of unease. It's as a slight, even if, even if. There's not anything particularly creepy about them. See, this is one of the myths about psychopaths, that they're all sexy and cool and dynamic. They're not. Very few are. Most of them have the creep factor big time. They're charmless, a lot of them. But they're very good at flattery. And that flattery and that, that spinning of uh, love bombing and word salad is what bypasses your intuition. But your initial intuition, if you think back of all the ones you ever met, you're going, even if they're like, hey, Vinny, how's it going, buddy? You know, that kind of thing. You were still thinking inside something something not right there you kind of recoil. I don't know what it is yeah a little kind of intuitive bang kind of hits you and that's because according to some people their energetic frequency that they emit is not quite in sync with us and we initially count it can counter them we're out of sync our intuition spots it but because they start saying things like I love your radio show, Vinny, it's great. Oh, Thomas, I've seen you. Your books are fantastic. Blah, blah, blah. That's what makes you click in with them. That, 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 that fires the mirror neurons in your brain to click in with their frequency. They're masters of deception, playing, mm. on, playing, on, your, playing on your neurochemicals. And this is what I think you, we, they mean by this whole thing energetically. Now, I will tell you something here, and I swear to God this is true. I have a friend, and this, you know, this is a, I had a friend years ago in New York. We've got about 20 seconds to break. He was dating a girl, right? And he told me that they were having a row one night, and he said he swore to, and this guy's not a, not a, not a, a wise ass. He told me that her eye pupils went to slits when she was angry with him. Wow. He, yeah. Yeah. Well, there was also an eye study that found that 4% of people have reptilian eyes. Hm, we'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinny Eastwood Show. I'm a renegade fighter and a lover and a winner. And my very special guest is Thomas Sheridan. Now, we were talking over the break about um, uh, two things, I think. One was the spiritual aspect of psychopaths. You know, there's plenty of there's plenty of people around the world who aren't psychopaths who are uh, deeply religious. They draw strength from higher powers, higher consciousness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so there must be a negative spectrum version of that. Uh, for psychopaths, you know, like dark druids tap in with uh, all the evil souls and what have you. And then there was this other uh, element um, of a psychopath who was having a brain scan. I think it was a, 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 a murderer or something like that. And they asked him to pretend that he was feeling certain emotions that psychopaths don't generally feel, like love or empathy or, or something of that nature. And the same areas of his brain lit up as it would as he was a normal person. 
just by him pretending, it gave people some cause to believe that, oh, maybe we can reverse the psychopathic nature. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's even possible. So first first aspect I, want, I wanted to um, uh, get your perspective on is the uh, the spiritual aspect. You know, is, is there like some kind of a, uh, I don't know, some dark lord Sauron that psychopaths can, can, and can put on some kind of metaphysical ring and, and visit the, 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 the ethereal, dark, invisible realm? Well, they don't seem to have a spiritual aspect to them, either positive or negative. They don't dream, for instance. They don't do art. They don't have really have creativity. They don't have deeper insights, which, which, which is what I would consider spiritual to be, a, a sense of a, of a depth beyond this reality. They seem to be very much focused in the moment. You know, they don't have dreams. They, this is because they're deficient. Well, they're not deficient. Their, their frontal cortex is switched off. But... Uh, you know, if you were to ask me beyond everything, and, you know, I'm this close to being an atheist, but at that distance is still pretty big. It's that close, right? And uh, yeah, so I'm not, you know, I, I'm very interested in all spirituality and all religious traditions and everything. I'm very, very interested, actually. But that's a different thing than believing, you know. But I do believe fundamentally at their core that they are a malevolent operating system, a software system, and that had to be programmed somewhere else. And I believe that somewhere else is the root of the whole psychopathic experience. If we could find where that, where, who, who or what is doing that programming, if it's even the human race doing it through our collective consciousness, I don't know. But I really do believe that ultimately it comes down to the consciousness and they have a malevolent consciousness and that's just the end of it for me. It's nothing to do with their brains. It's nothing to do with their brains because all the brain parts are there. They're all working. They're just only using the bits they need mm. because they don't care. They don't care. Now, you said about that brain scan, right? Well, an, any woman can fake an orgasm, right? Any psychopath can fake em can fake empathy but here's the important one uh, that test that that research they had in in that in holland that you just referenced a few months back was pretty rubbish actually because I, I i got the actual original research paper and basically what they showed was that psychopaths could have empathy if they were told to imagine what empathy was like so again it's acting but also here's the important one people confuse empathy with compassion Empathy and compassion are two different things. Empathy just means an, a social understanding. It's a social connection, an understanding of the person next to a certain needs, the person beside a certain needs, but it's not necessarily a loving or a sort of a, a transcendental emotional thing. It's not that at all. That's compassion. Compassion is when you can look at another person and you can say, oh, my God, I feel so bad for them, I'm going to help they don't, that's not empathy. That's compassion. Very important distinction there. That that these researchers at this 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 uh, program completely missed out on. Another thing too, they were hung up on mirror neurons. Now, this was the, what was interesting about this tour. Mirror neurons are what actually helps in empathy integrate between people, between humans. And it seemed to be that this, when this psychopath was actually asked to imagine what love was like. Is mirror neurons for the first time ever became active. Now, you can that you could say that shows he has empathy. Yes, but empathy is not the same thing as compassion. He was able to understand the concept of love, but that's not the same thing as love. In the same way, faking an orgasm is not the same thing as an orgasm. Now, here's a good one for you. If you were to take, say, D Day, right, 1944 D Day, right. Those landing craft doors open. Those young American lads walk out into Omaha Beach. It's mayhem. They're, they've seen their friends blown up all around them. You could have several guys there who were good, kind, loving, nice fellows who never harmed religious boys, who never harmed anyone in their lives. But because of the intensity of the situation, by the time they got to those Germans, they were starting to kill them as prisoners. If you were to put them under a CAT scan, at that point, if they had fMRI scans back then, you would have found they had the same brain as a psychopath in that moment. However, that does not mean that those fellas were psychopaths. They just had to go into a psychopathic state in order to survive a horrific military engagement. However, when the war was over, they went back home and they were back to, or they were back to normal again. Well, many just, they weren't psychopaths. 
There's also those who get um, damaged by it and uh, and suffer shell shock really badly. For the yeah, but, that, the but that's but traumatic that, that's stress. An, that's not psychopathy. No, that's a different thing. That's because they've been very damaged. Mm. That's because that shows they are normal. But they, they put, I think actually this post-traumatic stress comes from have actually they became psychopaths for a little bit, you know, in terms of their, their neurochemical processing. And I think that's what actually caused the damage. So it's the same thing. It does just because they were what in that position didn't make them psychopaths, and just because a psychopath pretended he could he knew what love was doesn't make him empathy, well, empathic, bit, or is, is it possible to reconcile? Like, let's say, for example, an ordinary person can turn psychopathic permanently. Is that possible? If with the right stimuli, with the yeah, right mind control have, techniques. If they had, Oh, definitely. Uh, they could also happen with a virus and things like that. I mean, it could happen with something like syphilis in the old days. You know, like syphilis could eat away at the frontal cortex of their brain, their amygdala and the limbic regions. Yeah, absolutely it could happen. I'm sure I'm sure many of these people who are normal and then, you know, got some kind of horrific mental disorder or some accident and or even extreme post-traumatic stress and then went crazy killing people in shopping malls. I'm sure that's what happened there. Yeah, and you say they can do it through mind control and stuff. Absolutely they can because if you can invoke dissociative identity disorder, which is when they partition the brain into different sections, and that's what MK Ultra was really about. They were trying to partition different parts of the cerebral cortex in order to create one personality in one and one personality in another. Well, there's no reason why you couldn't actually remove the frontal lobes and limbic region of the brain in terms of like a mind control program or even drugs or even, you know, even like some kind of ray beam or something. And what's frightening about that, Vinny, is DARPA in the United States are actually working on a military helmet that does just that. When they go into battle, it actually fires. It has a ma electromagnetic fields which actually block the limbic regions and the amygdala on the, on the brain and then they cannot actually process empathy and compassion and that is t and DARPA have this in production in fact I have the research paper from MIT it was leaked to me a few years ago by a professor who was working on the project and, and they were actually they found that if you put electromagnetic electromagnetic uh, fields at certain parts around the skull you can actually switch off the, the limbic regions which cause you to make moral, moral decisions they're almost like the gearbox of the brain and they found that when they put them on so the, the DARPA said great and then they start developing military headgear that would actually switch off the empathy and the compassion in soldiers so that's how scary it's got now there's also elements where um, the brain can be taught how to do things if it doesn't have an alternative like uh, for example there's um there's these chips that you can implant into the brain and after a while the brain will learn how to interface and actually use the chip um now i was wondering you were talking about how they dis am able to disable the frontal lobes the amygdala and what have you in order to produce psychopathy is it possible to block and disable the reptilian cortex in the brain in order to force the brain to use the frontal lobes no, because the 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 the, the lower brain stem is like first gear, and it's the neck direct <coughs> directly. <coughs> excuse me, directly connected to your spinal column. It's directly connected to the you know parts of your brain that process your five senses. Your optical cortex is back there where the process is your eyes. That's why psychopaths have crazy eyes because they're they're all connected down that area. Your hearing and so on. So if you were to actually switch off the lower brain stem, what would happen would be the rest of the brain would shut down. It's like force gear. You can't. You, if, you, if, you, if you went to a car's gearbox and it moved first and second gear, there's no way you could start driving in, in third, fourth, and fifth. It's the same kind of thing. What they could do is, if they could create, and it's, it's, it would be a good thing if they could do this eventually, but then again, they probably wouldn't do it to the people around the world. But if they could develop some kind of chip that could actually function as a sort of a, a fail-safe, in terms of their amygdala so when they're making the decision that may be psychopathic it may the chip may actually f become like a a fail safe switch to say no you can't do this in an emotional sense to make them believe the repercussions will ultimately come back to you mm. like in a um like a mental dog collar you know those little shock collars that they give the dogs you know dogs being naughty Precisely. or something like it would be cool if actually the politicians and the scumbags and everything had the little electric collars around them, you know. Bad politicians. Ow! You know. 
I, I would actually be really amused by that uh, endlessly. We'll be right back after the break with my very special guest, Thomas Sheridan, ladies and gentlemen, author of Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. It's now hour number two. It's the fastest two hours in talk radio, the lighter side of genocide, because in a world so full of chaos and madness, if you lose your sense of humour, you'll go freaking nuts. Ah, <sighs> Sanity. It's a real difficult one to hold on to. It's kind of like um, paper gold assets, in a way. It doesn't really exist. Sanity and it? paper. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, it, it's... Uh, can, you, can you understand, is there a difference between sanity and the perception of sanity? Because I know there's a hell of a lot of people around there who, who, who still haven't woken up and they think that what they're doing is sane, you know? They're getting, they're getting in their slave monkey suit, they're going to their slave job, stuck in the slave traffic, doing their slave, doing their slave work and what have you. And they think that they're sane and they think that people with megaphones on the side of the street saying uh, society is fracked are the crazy ones. Yeah, you see, because in psychiatry uh, and in psychology, there is actually no baseline for sanity. Nobody knows where sanity ends and insanity begins. It's purely an arbitrary, you know, transient line in the sand. That means nothing really. You could have people who were alive in the 1920s, if they were brought into this world today, they would think this world was insane. And they'd probably be classified as being insane by psychiatry. For instance, years ago, people would be, would be like less sort of uh, guarded. There would be no political correctness. So they might be more, more open about their, their prejudices. doesn't mean they're evil. It's just how the life was back then. Yet under the DSM today, they would be considered you know, disabled, psychologically disordered, whatever, or psychiatrically affected. So there's no baseline to sanity and insanity. There just isn't. Now, there are, you can obviously see people who are definitely not well and are not functioning in the society. And that's, 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 that's what annoys me because those people are sick and those people are ill. But when somebody holds a different opinion or is eccentric or is, you know, a maverick in some way, this whole thing of you're nuts or you're insane is, a, is used as a social control mechanism. Kind of like political correctness. I figured out that the problem, the, the whole agenda behind political correctness is to stop people saying what they really think. Well, political correctness is fascism. I have nothing to do with people. Anyone who comes into my life that has overt politically correct behaviours, I know I'm dealing with an absolute muppet. I will have nothing to do with them because if they're dishonest in their feelings that way they're dishonest in every other aspect of life so for instance if they're looking for misogynists and homophobes and racists everywhere that shows me that they have a fascist nature and also if they're dishonest about that they're dishonest about everything oh that you know that's one of my yardsticks for people anyone who is overtly politically correct is fundamentally at heart flawed because a normal compassionate person knows it's wrong to walk up to a black person and say a racial term or a jewish person or a gay person you don't do that okay you don't do it we know that we know it would hurt their feelings because the same but a, a, a person who invokes political correctness i believe doesn't actually have those feelings and they would say them if they didn't put their own brakes on themselves so I do not trust people. It's the same thing with people who say we need religion in order to have morals. What? It's the same kind of. It's the same crappy argument. Yeah. Um, uh, when you say that, uh, it reminds me of a lot of the um, people that I've made videos for, or even had on this radio show in the uh, socialist wing. Uh, in New Zealand here, uh, some of them overtly politically correct, and then I've seen lots of other instances where they started to attack. Uh, activists whom I respect who have never done anything wrong and lie about them and hold these little uh, socialist kangaroo courts and what have you. So that's actually quite a profound realisation that's just hit me because of what you said there. Oh yeah, I've had huge problems with, with socialists. And I've never met a socialist who was a worker. They all seem to be from wealthy or well-off families. They all seem to be doing quite well. I, uh, to me, they, they, they are used as, as just bullies, as just thugs. They're, they're brown shorts. The brown shorts of today 
are these sort of like anti-Nazi leagues, anti-this league, pro-black, you know, all these stupid kind of like white folks who think that they have to regulate other white folks, that crowd, I can't stand them because they're, they're thugs because, again, they don't have, you know, decency. So therefore they assume the rest of us don't have it either. And we have to be regulated by them because they've discovered decency in the same way a born, a Christ, born again Christian has discovered Jesus. Yeah. In fact, that was funny. I um I remember um I was in at work one time, and I had this really difficult customer who just wasn't being honest with me, you know, kind of thing. Um, and all I wanted to do was get his uh get his phone bill faxed to me so that I could actually do a proper analysis of his of his phone bill. Um, and so he was telling me how much I think his landlines were costing that they were like, uh, uh, $16 each. And I was like, that's, that's not possible. They're at least $40 each. And I knew that we had like this digital version that where they were like $7 each. So I was like, you know what? This guy's probably not telling me the truth. So I'll tell you what, I'll just, I'll just BS him a little just so that he can send me his bills so that I can actually go ahead and help him, you know, and actually try, try and do something for him. And I and I got the bill and I, and I said yeah all right thank God a little little bit of BS goes goes a, goes a long way when you can actually help people with it and um, I think there was this born again Christian lady who said oh you don't have any conscience like right in the middle of the like the floor of all these callers and everything like really loudly in front of everybody it's like freaking hell and then I pulled her aside into the um, into the staff room and I say why did you say that she goes I didn't say it I didn't say it and then I go yep born again Christian. Devil made her do it. <laughs> you know, it, it's when you deny your own faults, that's when you become truly faulty. Exactly. Because then you've de- denied your own humanity. You've denied, And then what happens is you become a kind of a police, a sort of a moral police of others. Because what happens is you're no longer in control of yourself. I mean, I can honestly say the most... The most politically correct people I've known were also among the most indecent I ever met. They yeah. had no decency yeah. in them. Yeah. Well, I think I've got moral authority. I've captured the moral high ground. Yeah. Therefore, I can not have to abide by it myself and just tell everybody else to. That's totally hypocritical. It's what yeah. I call, um, and, and when born agains do that, I call them hypocristians. Hypocristians, yeah. It's like uh, when they say, what would Jesus do? I tell you what they would, but if Jesus was around, he wouldn't do what you do. Yeah. That's, that's, that, it's what would, you, what would you do if Jesus was there? He wouldn't, he wouldn't do anything what you're doing. No, nah, he probably wouldn't. Eh? He'd probably throw you out of the temple with the, along with the bankers. Yeah, he'd be on shows like this. I have no doubt about it. Yeah. If, if the, real, the real Jesus, if you can find him in that text, he was, he was like a radical of his day. And he was ready for a showdown with the psychopathic control grid of the Roman Empire in his day, and his and in the 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 temple, he was he was ready for a showdown. Yeah, yeah. Well, is that possible in this day and age? Because I I, I believe I mentioned this in the first segment about somebody who was uh, kind of like really depressed and saying, "Oh, it's hopeless. We can give up and everything." And I say, you know, go and kind of kill yourself if if you if you think that your life isn't worth living. Uh, stop contaminating the rest of us with with your depression um but you know that, that was pretty callous of me and, and i regret saying that as i said um however is it actually possible to override the system right and and uh, i thought about it like this you know how how when they tie down those old school zeppelins or, or whatever and those big hangers and they have ropes down on the front and on the back and in the middle and all over the place right they got all these different ropes and all these different points holding this one zeppelin down and I think that's that's kind of like how many ropes our minds or how many ropes our countries are bound under the uh, psychopathic elite control structure. So that in order to release and allow your mind to float free or allow your country to be free, all of those ties have to be severed simultaneously. That means all your mind control has to be severed, or your poison food has to be severed, or the chemtrails have to be severed, the corruption, the uh, the banking system, and, and everything, basically, needs to be taken away simultaneously in order to get any form of freedom back. 
in order to accomplish this though it's what people have been calling the mass awakening and i had my um my facebook status the other day in order to have critical mass the masses have to be able to think critically they can't even many people in the alternative can't think critically it's unfortunate but they can't mm. they they just they just become the second level of the control system they jump up into the next level and they're critical with a new sphere of a uh, a new paradigm they ha you have to, what 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 they really have to do is be like a baby and start from fresh that you know nothing and you can't carry your baggage with you from before but i've noticed that i mean recently i had a bit of a hullabaloo with the russell brand thing which it wasn't a, it wasn't bad for me in the end but at first i was very badly attacked and what i'd realized what these people had just gone from stage one to stage two and they were still depending on an exterior figure to 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 do it for them and they assumed i was attacking russell brand personally and if you listen to what i wrote and said i didn't i was talking, I was talking about the shit you drew. The stuff he was coming out with, which was, to me, it was just, it was like something Bono was coming, like just another celebrity talking through his, his, his backside. And so I said, hold on a second, and you shouldn't be externalizing this stuff. But then it made me read what was, that was quite surprised. Now, I have to say, a, an awful lot of people stood by me as well. But it was quite surprising to me how hostile people who I thought were pretty cool and woken up and were no lot had broken from the Hollywood spell suddenly found that they had this Hollywood leader to say to to follow. Now that's not to say that some of the stuff he said didn't have merit. Absolutely it did. But at the same time too, he was on the BBC, he was you know, I don't want to get his personal life, but he's surrounded by bankers. Basically, he has an awful lot of money, he's, and he's asking for so, he's asking for a redistribution of wealth. Well, why doesn't he give away lots of his money to begin with? You know, it's this kind of thing, and it just seemed to be another Bono, another Bob Geldof, another celebrity talking about this stuff. And and I, and I've come to see that there is an element of coaching of activism among celebrities. But it was interesting for me how many people that I thought were woken up where still the spell of celebrity, the most powerful force on this earth, still had them. I think it's because we've got this uh, this complex that humans do like leaders. We like to be led, don't we? We like to look up to people. Unfortunately. We like to find good examples to follow. I mean, like, i got people who, who look up to me and, 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 and what have you, and uh, maybe that's not such a bad thing, but then again, at the same time, I'd rather them have faith in themselves than faith in me. You know, you know what I'm saying? I think that's far more valuable. I'd rather somebody stop listening to my show and begin their own rather than listen to me for years and years and years without doing a single broadcast of their own. You know what I'm saying? I don't want yep. to be your savior, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to be your leader. I'm just just trying to help you recognize that you don't need one and stop thinking that I am one just because I'm telling you that you don't need one. Exactly. You should be your own leader. But at the same time, too, there's nothing wrong with being inspired. I'm inspired by fellas like you. I'm inspired by lots of people that are doing stuff that you're doing. But at the same time, too, I don't you don't follow me i don't follow you but we both say oh, i like what he has to say about this good it's important and i'll share it with other people that's a different thing uh, what i don't like is, is is the celebrity aspect the worst this sort of idolization because he you know somebody's famous and they're among the rich and famous therefore he then has validated all those years of my friends and family thinking i was a nut because i said vaccines don't work you know, that kind of a thing. And it becomes a compensatory me mechanism. And therefore, you abdicate your own personal responsibilities as being a woken up person yeah. to your celebrity. And, that, and that's a dangerous road to go down. And I just wanted, all I wanted to do was say to people, put the brakes on. Just put the brakes on. Yeah. Well, I think that's perfectly rational, isn't it? It reminds me of the um, the album cover of a, a, a corn album called Follow the Leader. And they got a hopscotch squares leading off of a cliff. And 
and I'm thinking that's kind of what's happening now with uh, celebrity culture and uh, and uh, government and new a whole bunch of new political parties have started to come out and, th- and things like uh, that and yeah. garnering people's support and what have you as an alternative to the mainstream but it's just another mainstream alternative for frack's sake why can't people see it's all a scam it's just a scam reinventing itself so it can continue to scam you sweet mother of mercy why can't you see it <sighs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It's like, I, I, you know, I even predicted in England a new left party was coming now. Sure enough, you <laughs> see left is here. It was like, it was like I, I said, I should be in Las Vegas, like, rolling the dice. It's got so predictable at this point. It's, they just give us new, new scams to follow. Yeah. Same old, same old rubbish. Yeah, well, the parliamentary roundtable is a crap table. I'll give it that much. It does belong in Vegas. Especially with all the gambling derivatives. Um, now, I was thinking, of course, that this element of a savior complex, and, and, and you mentioned this word, inspire, okay? Inspiration. If somebody makes you feel happy to do nothing, that's not inspiration, okay? They're, they're just entertainment. If somebody's words motivate you to stop doing what you're doing and course correct that's inspiration that's the kind of thing you should be looking for don't look for things that make you feel comfortable look for things that make you uncomfortable uncomfortable things make you change those things that you want to enjoy the entertainment the frivolity the uh, the, 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 the whatever it is that you've got in your life that makes you stop yourself from making a difference in the world that is the thing that you shouldn't be paying yeah. attention to a grain of sand in an oyster shell makes a peril make a peril yeah precisely and uh i think it's a um it's a good one actually the grain of sand in the oyster shell Not much like a seed on an oak tree and uh I think that's something Bill Hicks said. Uh, I'm just planting seeds, planting seeds. If they take, if they take root and they bear fruit, I don't know. I'm just feel better planting them. And um, this is a a great approach, I think, because what truth is in a lot of them. And um, I think uh, one of my colleagues did a um, a show about what's called truth of snobbery, where we start thinking we're better than everybody else. Ah, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're all sheep and I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, everybody else might be a slave, but that doesn't mean that you're free. We'll be right back after no. the break at the com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. Um, yeah, I, I also want to encourage people that... The, I've got a very eclectic taste in music, some of which old, some of which new, some of which obscure, some of which popular... And I think that's because it reflects my social circles. A lot of my friends are, are, are a lot older than I. And um, I think of that, that uh, Nat King Cole song, uh, Unforgettable. Have you ever seen the film Watchmen, Thomas? No? Oh, it, it's, a, it's a great movie for, for a truther, I think. It's, um, it's a superhero movie kind of thing. Except it's a lot darker than the average superhero movie. It's really violent and there's a lot of conspiracy and skullduggery and scumbaggery going on in there. High technology, the whole the whole thing. And um, one of the opening scenes of it is these two superheroes having a really, really massive fight and one of them uh, being killed. And the, the theme music for it is Nat King Cole's Unforgettable, you know? So as they're flying around the room... Uh, breaking through tables, having their heads slammed through granite bench tops and things of that nature. It's just... (laughs) I like it when people put ironic music, you know, like music that doesn't fit into into something uh, completely different and yet somehow make it work. And I think that is one of the uh, most wonderful things about uh, 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 this show as well, is that we make terrible, terrible things easy to digest and actually fun. Well, that's how you get through it. It's funny you mentioned that. The first film I remember where they used that technique was American Werewolf in London. 
because I had heard it was this incredible horror film, and I went to see it, and it starts off with the that's blue moon. You saw me standing alone, and you're expecting to see someone's head being ripped off or something. And it was a genius, ironic start to a film. So it's the same idea. That Nat King's Cole song is is so beautiful. It's hard to even. It's almost hard to even believe that they could capture that much beauty on one record. I love that song. It's absolutely gorgeous. I have very eclectic taste in music well, as well, but I just I like anything that has a sense of honesty in it. I don't care if it's death metal, not King Cole, hip-hop. I don't care. Once once the honesty comes through, I'm, I'm there. Yeah. Well, I think music lovers are sort of like the people on the beach with the metal detector. They're shuffling through an entire beach of sand to find those little uh, metal metallic nuggets of valuable uh, material. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. You'll get a few turk, you'll get, you'll get a few Coke bottles uh, tops and you'll get a few cans, but now and again, you might find a Rolex watch or a ring or something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I think this is what uh, people uh uh, don't realize and, and I noticed this when I was editing um, a song over over the weekend with my bandmate is he kept telling me oh man I'm tired it's it's done it's done let's stop editing and I'm like no 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 no, no, no. There's, there's, there's tiny little bits in there just that there just that there you know and then you listen to it again and he's like oh there's another little thing there and, there. and it seems like it's endless it seems like it's relentless but because I was relentless because I wasn't prepared to give up, actually managed to perfect the song, right? That's what persistence now gives us. That's what that ability to not take no for an answer, to not leave well enough alone in the positive sense of the word. That's the very antithesis to psychopathy in a lot of ways, because you're capable of persevering through your frustration, through your anger, through all those displeasures in order to create something beautiful. Oh, yeah, they wouldn't even understand that. They would actually steal another person's song and say that they were singing it and they wrote it. Yeah. That's what they do. And and they wouldn't, to them it would be just, the, they wouldn't understand the process of creating it. Just take it. It's mine. Now, here's another thing. Do they actually believe their own BS? Yeah, I think at some levels they do. Because they think they're God. They think they're God. They think they can get away with anything, and they have because they have like, you know, uh, testicles of of titanium. They uh, they they it, you, there's a kind of a hubris there that's like it's beyond delusion. They actually really absolutely do believe. I think in most cases they're they're BS. I really do believe that's true. That's why they can. That's why they can pass lie detector tests. They can pass lie detector tests. Well, like Absolutely. all of them, yeah. how, how verified is that? Oh, very verified. And they, they, it actually has been shown that they can actually, they put, the more you put them in the lie detector test, the better they get at uh, actually uh, dodging it. Wow. They, they don't have any kind of internal self-reflection. When they're lying, they, when they're lying, you see, what happens is, suppose a psychopath robbed the bank, right? And he was a suspect in the robbery. And, and they, had, they had good evidence against him, but not the, all the evidence. As far as he's concerned, he didn't do it because he hasn't been caught yet. That's their logic, right? Mm -hmm. The logic is I, he didn't rob the bank because he hasn't been caught yet. So you put them under polygraph, and when he, when you ask him, did you rob the bank? Well, in, his, in, in their warped psychopathic consciousness, he hasn't robbed the bank because he hasn't been caught yet. You understand? It's only when he was he gets caught robbing the bank that he's robbed the bank. Otherwise, he's not responsible for it. It's there's no sense of any kind of uh, owning up to any kind of responsibility. It doesn't exist. That reminds me of a Robert Redford film called Three Days of the Condor. He's a uh, young agent and he comes back to his office and everybody's been killed, and he just gets left hung out to dry uh, by the agency. And he has this conversation with a section chief uh, towards the end of the film where he says, what's wrong with you people? You think that not being caught in a lie is the same thing as telling the truth. That's it. That's exactly that's exactly what they, they're like. This is the ass law and criminal psychologist, law enforcement agents dealing with like mafia guys and stuff. That's what they're like. Henry Hill 
who the movie's Goodfellas was based on. When I lived in New York, a boss I had, I used to when I was when I was first starting out, I used to house paint houses. And my boss was the he had the painting contracting company and he used to do contracting work for Henry Hill and that gang that was that was were in the Goodfellas movie. And he said Henry Hill was the most dishonest person he ever met in his life. He said he was so he said he would rub the eyeball out of your head, right? And unless there was some witness there apart from you and or even video evidence, he would never admit he did it. He said he was he never he never met and away that was one of the first psychopaths I can remember being told about. And I didn't that have that kind of language back then to describe them. But he said to me that like this guy had absolutely no to him lying and the truth were just completely arbitrary. He would he, he just was those he never told the truth to anyone in his life ever. And he never ever served anyone other than himself. And that's why he turned all his own friends in, not because he had a, a crisis like in that movie Goodfellows. It was simply to save his own hide. Yeah. Yeah. Well they'll sell their own grandmother for a nickel, you heard that saying? Yeah. When he died, I was listening to the Howard Stern show because he used to go on the Howard Stern show a lot, and I wanted to hear what Howard Stern said about him. And Howard Stern was saying he was the like he was the most disgusting human being I've ever known. He had absolutely no decency in him. You know, he, even he, he just he would lie, he would let you down. Like he was supposed to appear in some Howard Stern movie, and uh, he, he, he tried to change the contract at the last moment. He was. He just lived in the world of swindling and lying people. He knew no other way to live. Now, if you don't have any decency, what room does that leave for men like us? You, you've seen the movie The Dark Knight, and um, you recall the, the interaction between Harvey Two-Face and Batman towards the end of the film when Harvey's kidnapped um, Commissioner Gordon's family. And he, he was t- saying that basically we failed. We, di- we, we didn't uh, get rid of the crime in Gotham because we were trying to be decent men in an indecent time. And I thought that was quite profound for me. And, and, and uh, one of my mates has been kind of uh, shafted a little, a little bit lately. He's had uh, bad relationships with his missus and, and all of this kind of thing. And, and uh, people that he's been very generous to, giving nothing back and only taking more. And I said to him uh, that same line, you know, that's our problem, man. That is our problem. We're decent men. In an indecent time. Yeah, and you see, that was even shown that movie. What was it? Uh, the Untouchables, the what the the busting the, the gangs in Chicago, and Elliot Ness and all those guys back in their day. And you see how it was decency and being good is what got the two of the two who were killed, Sean Connery and the other guy. And Sean Connery, you know, the guy came to kill him, and he he beat him up, and he says, "Get out of here, you scumbag." He goes, hey, you, you brought a knife to a gunfight." And what he didn't, he, because he let the guy go, it gave the guy with the machine gun on the roof a chance to shoot him. Uh, the, so that is, it was the de- it was the act of humanity is what brought the two guys down in that film, and that's what that film really showed. And it was a, a pivotal scene in there. It was actually based on a Russian silent film where the actor, I forget his name, he was a big star back then, the dark, good-looking Italian guy, and he uh, he grabs a baby that's going down in a baby carriage down the steps. And he has to make the decision to save the baby and put himself in danger. And he does. He, he saves the baby and he kills the bad guy. And that was the pip, that was the pivotal point in the film where compassion finally paid off for the for the for the the cops. Mm. Now, unfortunately, it sort of works the opposite in the system, right? I, I've um, said for a long time that justice is not a natural state. It certainly doesn't exist in nature. You know, you never see a lion uh, being killed by a herd of gazelle or something like that because the lion ate one of their babies, do you? No, it doesn't happen. Things... I disagree. No? I disagree. There are videos on YouTube, believe it or not, Finney, that show herds of wildebeest beating the crap out of video. lions. I've seen that video, there's but even it doesn't happen all the time. You, it doesn't happen all the time, but there's a great metaphor and lesson there for us. Yeah. There's one where you see a zebra saving her baby, and it, it actually I think it actually kills the lioness. Mm. It stamps on it while it's under the water. And mm. that's, that shows you that even in the natural world, this Darwinism stuff, there are they, it's not necessarily true. That, I'm, I'm, that I'm, I'm arguing something very completely inspiring. different here. I'm arguing something different okay. here. Because um, I'm talking about justice, self-defense, and uh, and herd mentalities, yeah. uh, vigilante yeah. justice. That's what exists in nature. But 
a trial, facts, evidence, corroborations, testimonies, yeah. fa- fairness, an, an actual system, so that if somebody is murdered or their private property damaged or, or stolen or something of that nature, there is a comeuppance for that person without the necessity for uh, a violence necessarily. There, there will be um, a, a civil civil way of proceeding things. And that certainly doesn't exist in nature. It's, it's called the law of the jungle in the nature. And uh, we've created a completely different system. Now, our system would work if it was actually applied. You know what I'm saying? Because the problem is we've got psychos uh, running the uh, judicial system, psychos making all the laws and manipulating everybody into following all of this BS. Whereas the very concept of it, at its core, the lie that they tell everybody, if that was true, it would be great. But it can only be made artificially right this is why i don't believe uh, necessarily in uh, uh uh that karmic idea of good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people because i don't think that you can actually rely on nature to do that for you you either have to do that yourself or you have to have a system that is not corrupt in order to enforce that will and to make society fair make society just make society safe yeah, it's the whole, the wisdom of Solomon thing. We don't have, like you said, the justice system, if it worked as it was applied, it would be wonderful. It would be absolutely a, a utopian in terms of delivering a sense of fairness in society. But as you said, it's corrupt. So what happens, it, you know, so this is also why there are no psychopaths in indigenous cultures. They just don't exist because they kill them off. Hmm. As soon as they recognize them, they kill them because they realize that the whole... The whole tribe is in extreme danger because of this one this one parasite in there. And so he'll be thrown off a cliff or something while they go on a hunting trip. Whether it be he'll be sorry if he uses bait or something. But uh Oh, this reminds what me happened wanted, to, this is something I wanted to ask you, Thomas. Should being a psychopath, a clinically diagnosed psychopath, be a death penalty offence? Because you cannot possibly be of use to humanity if you're a psychopath and there's no coming back from that like i was i was wondering of 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 that idea and i find it it poses too many moral gray areas to ever institute no i would be totally against that for a few reasons one i think everyone is entitled to human rights if they're human so they can't just do that's like eugenics that would be just like eugenics and they would and you know what happened when he they would they would kill the poor psychopaths and the rich ones like Tony Blair would would still get like knighthoods. It, do you know how the system works yourself? Yeah. So they just extrapolate the current justice system to that. Welcome to back, ladies and gentlemen, to about the show that's about getting depressed and then going through with a digress. My very special guest is hey, that rhymes three times. Hey, I just rhymed again. And there's Thomas Sheridan, who wrote the book Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath. And I do believe that, that uh, your research material and the interviews that you've done over the years have um, made a fracking huge impact, right? Like, it can't be calculated nor underestimated, I think. And I, I wonder, do you do you recognise the importance of yourself do do you realize what a great man you are well i don't know really i i i don't know i just i mean i I live in a country and i live in a small town where no one knows who i am but occasionally like when i go to a city like dublin people stop me on the streets and it shocks me oh you're thomas sheridan i've seen you on youtube or i've seen your videos i heard it so it is quite amazing to me uh, no, I'm not aware of it because it's just the kind of person I am. I live in a kind of a a bubble in my own mind, and I'm not really aware of like of my impact around the around the world until people tell me these things. And I just and there's something wrong with me that way, and I still don't kind of believe that. And I says ah, yeah, it's not really true. It's not as loads. It's not just you know. So it's not. I'm not. I'm not being deliberately humble or anything like that. It's just my nature. I've always been kind of like that. I'm not kind of. I'm like I'm unbelievably easygoing, you know. I'm just really am. It's and it's probably a good thing because it keeps me keeps me out of trouble. Well, it's a musician thing. Musicians uh, uh, take criticism sometimes personally, 
but they also are very, very reluctant to profess how good they are, even when they're really, really good. The best musicians, at, at least. And I was telling my, uh, my bandmate this, and he says, oh, I don't worry about getting criticised anymore. And I go, why not? He goes, because people don't criticise me anymore. Because <laughs> he practices four hours a night. <laughs> Well, it's like uh, I think it's a I think it's an Irish thing too as well because if, if you're like famous or well known in Ireland and you, or anything like I'm talking about like even you're you're really well known, there's not, you know even the politicians when they walk into a pub or a restaurant, someone will say to them, not this 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 gobshite again," you know. So it's like if there's something in this culture here where you're not. It's a healthy thing too where you're always reminded that you're no better than the rest of us. And so I think that's an inherent Irish thing. I think it's one of our better traits uh, that it's like it's it, it, it puts a safety valve on you because you look at what happens when when it doesn't work and someone like Bono <laughs> and he thinks he, he thinks he actually is some kind of like uh, savior. Did you ever see the South Park episode? Uh, with, with oh, Bono, with, with uh, the biggest, the biggest, the biggest tour. That oh, was a great one. Oh, it's hilarious! That was a it... classic. Except they, they, the accent was terrible. Yeah. But the, it was terrible. It was like this, like hybrid South African <laughs> Scottish accent. But it was like it, it, Randy, Randy Marsh one had the world's record for the biggest bell movement, mm. and Bono, Bono beat him. <laughs> That was brilliant. That was, was, that was brilliant. And it wasn't because Bono uh, was uh, what, what? What was it? It's because Bono himself was the was the uh, the bell movement record. Like he actually got where he was born, you know, as uh, as, yeah. as the world's <laughs> largest turd, and he got sprayed and ki- and loved, and he grew and he grew, and because he knew that he was a number two. He had to be number one at everything so that he would never be number two. <laughs> Nobody would ever call him number two. <laughs> uh, those guys were those guys when they were when they're funny, they're genius. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I love Randy Marsh. I love that character. He's like one of the best character father. Uh, that's one of the best. He's so neurotic, but yeah, at the same time you feel so bad for him. Yeah, yeah. I'm so startled. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've got this um, this uh, really wacky idea that we should really start. Um, you know how David Icke just started up this um, this new TV studio, right? Um, I think a non centralized cartoon studio with heaps of animated heaps of truther animators and writers and uh, directors and voice talent and stuff from all over the world. Uh, create cartoons together, truther cartoons, you know, like a like a South Park but on steroids. Oh, I told, I've been saying that for years. If we had those kinds of resources, it would be just it would be like a mixture of South Park, Monty Python, but better, mm, better. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, if we had those resources, we'd rule the world. We rule the world. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's a shame. I, I wish animation was was brought down to. The same way Photoshop and audio recording is, it's still not completely accessible to the ordinary guy. But the day it is, the day it is, really good animation is accept- accessible to us. Watch out, world! Because yeah. I'll, I'll definitely be, uh, I'll definitely be using it. Yeah, I mean, a program that does for animation what YouTube has done for video. Yeah, or you know, the music programs have done for recording to bring it, to make it very accessible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I think uh, there are a number of programs that are capable of doing that. They automatically animate things for you, like you can you can draw a head and, and arms and what have you, and then um, instruct the certain parts of the image to do certain things, and then it renders and then animates the entire image for you as if it was uh, in real motion. Yeah, I've seen them, but they're still kind of crude. Yeah, they're, they're, we're, we're a few years away from the the the, the big one. Mm, mm. The okay, it's like cameras, for example, used to cost like what hundred Gs for for a you know television slash movie a HD camera? camera. Yeah, a HD camera would be like three hundred grand, but not like fifteen years ago. Yeah, and now they're like you can you, you got one on your freaking phone. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Yep. Okay, so if it can be that easy, 
then surely we can come up with a technological solution to p- replace 500 Korean animators. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's the next one. That's the next stage. I'll definitely, I'll be on that like white on rice as soon as that's the, if that comes out because I, I, I have loads of ideas for cartoons and stuff. Oh, mate, it, it, it's going to be good. Now, this is another thing. I believe people need to uh, adopt more creative outlets in order to go against the new world order. Okay, so it, it's all very fun and fine and good to go out and start raving in people's faces and telling them about the scumbaggery and telling them you're a slave and blah, 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 9 an inside job, the vaccines are poison, la, 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 la. But if it ain't working and you've been doing it for 10 years, change your frickin' tact. Okay? This, this is what people are doing. It, it, it's... I come up with a new definition of insanity. Um, when all evidence is to the contrary and you still keep doing it, believing it'll work, that's insane. Yeah, and it never changed tact. Write a song, start a radio show, st- 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 you know, approach people differently. Hmm. That's a good one. Do it with a smile on your face rather than walking around saying, We're all screwed. Do it with a smile on your face, you know? Mm. Sometimes you need that, we're all screwed, in order to snap you out of your happy little uh, happy-go-lucky lifestyle, right? Um, Because I think it was when I was first uh, getting into this sort of information, it was in the fear paradigm. And it really messed me up. Uh, it, It destroyed my entire life, basically. You become angry, you become depressed, you become despondent. You uh, become apathetic. They lose relationships. All of them. All of them. You know, they just disappear. And I think that that's a, a necessary evil in a lot of cases. You got to take that first step. You got to be prepared to release all all of that all of that illusion out of your life and go through that traumatic, suffering, painful process of your awakening. Otherwise, you don't actually really see the value. And going through what you went through and as a result you don't really keep to your lessons you don't really take those lessons on board and you wind up becoming the very negativity that you wanted to start fighting against we have to learn to understand that destruction is not the end of the world it's an evolutionary step it's like I can always remember the one, one town I lived in, there was a factory there. And when the factory closed, everyone was like, oh, it's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. And when the factory, the, you know, they couldn't have, the, some people wanted to reopen the factory. And if they were like, when it wouldn't happen, it would, they'd say it was the end of the world. Don't, you know, and eventually what happened was they knocked down the factory and they built a beautiful park. And that was like, that factory had to die to make this beautiful park, which now employs people because they have concerts in the summer and they have events and fairs and, and crafts and arts fairs there, and it changed things. And that's the same thing with your life. Sometimes you have, it's like the tarot card in the tarot. The tarot has to fall. It has to be demolished. But just because there's rubble lying on the ground doesn't mean it's going to be there forever. You have to clear it out to begin again. People have to understand that when they're going to that stage where they're, where they're waking up and they lose their friends and all that kind of thing, that that's the tower falling. But that doesn't mean the tower won't rise again, and it will. And it'll be, it'll be more beautiful. Yeah. In 1776 foot tall skyscraper owned by Larry Silverstein, the tower has come back, baby. Thomas Sheridan, I think it's thomassheridanarts.com if I'm uh, not mistaken. thomassheridanarts.com, ladies and gentlemen. Check out his interviews. You go Google this man. He's got great stuff all over the web. Buy his I, books. And I have a, have a Sunday night radio show called The Philosophy. See you again sometime, folks. Thanks for listening. No matter where you live, globalism affects you. Did you know that the Vinnie Eastwood Show has more subscribers than New Zealand Herald TV and is New Zealand's most popular YouTube news channel where warm-hearted humour and a list of awesome guests talk about crucial issues which the mainstream media ignore. A show where you, the listener, can phone up with questions, comments and suggestions of guests. Vinnie is building a hub to connect truthers with raw information they need to become active. 
He can help you gain further skills such as website building, producing audio and video, and creating revenue streams in your own multimedia environment. Because Vinny supports such a wide range of people in the truth movement, he is not government or corporate backed and relies entirely on your donations. Give now, give generously, or subscribe for $10 a month for access to ad-free video archives. Just visit the and click donate. Thank you.